Churches of Christ presents Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Welcome to Speaking the Truth in Love. My name is Ivy Powell. I preach for the Lord's Church at Prairie Grove, Missouri, which is about 16 miles west of West Plains. I am retired from full-time local work. I am also engaged two days a week counseling for the Curry Street Church of Christ in West Plains, where I formerly preached for a great number of years. We want to certainly thank you for tuning in to the program. We're thankful for sister congregations that helped make this program possible. And I want to thank Brother Jimmy Young and the elders for giving me this opportunity to be with you for the month of October. We're going to be discussing some things that you need to know. And today's lesson is a lesson that is very fundamental, but one that is extremely important. Some, not all, some things you need to know about the Bible. In Psalm 119, David said in the 97th verse, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, I want you to pause and consider that David had only probably five books at his disposal. We have 66 books. We are indeed blessed to have the inspired, inerrant, all authoritative word at our fingertips. As Brother John Ramsey will often say, we need to study the Bible more. And that is so true. Ignorance has always been man's greatest downfall. Some are of the opinion that if they don't know what the Lord teaches, that he will excuse them. My friend, we need to understand that the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, verse number 30. Some things we need to understand about the Bible is that all authority ultimately resides with Almighty God. Our Lord, before He ascended to the Father in Matthew 28 and verse 18, said that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So our authority is given to the Christ. God at one time spoke through the prophets. He spoke through the heads of the families. But now the Hebrew writer informs us in chapter 1 and verse 1 that He speaks to us through His Son. Ultimately, our Lord knew that, of course, while He was upon the earth, that He would die upon the cross, and then after His resurrection, He would go back to the Father. The Holy Spirit was sent to comfort and guide the apostles into all truth, John chapter 16 and verse 13. 
So you have the chain of authority here. God, Christ, then you have apostles. The Holy Spirit was sent, as stated, to guide the apostles into all truth. Now it is extremely important to note that all truth was given. There is nothing lacking. Individuals often will come to our doors and they would tell us that the Bible we have is good up to a point, and then all of a sudden they present to us what they call a latter-day revelation. We need to understand, friend, that there are no latter-day revelations. When you turn to the book of Galatians chapter 1, and I will give you time to turn there, often preachers, when preaching, will quote half a dozen passages of Scripture, and by the time folk get to the one that they're interested in, we're far down the road. So I, I'll slow the rhythm of the lesson down, give you time to turn to Galatians chapter 1. Notice carefully, Paul marveled that they were so soon removed from the faith. He says unto another gospel in verse 6, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and notice the next word, they would pervert, P-E-R-V-E-R-T, the gospel. Now what does that mean? Well, it means to corrupt it. It means to change it from its purpose. You take a chocolate cake. Chocolate cake is for the purpose of nourishing the body. Question mark, question mark about that, but that's what the purpose of it is. If there is a foreign ingredient, a poison injected into that mixture, then it would not help the body, but destroy the body. Well, that's the way it is with the Word of God. The Word of God is free from any and all contamination. It is as God intended for it to be. Food for the soul. When man adds to the Word of God, or he takes away from the Word of God, then he perverts or corrupts the message of God. For an example, the Lord said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Mark 16, 15 through 16. If an individual goes and fulfills what the Lord says, he will present the pure, unadulterated gospel of Christ. And when people hear it, believe it, and obey it, they will become a New Testament Christian. However, if a person injects false doctrine into the Word of God, or he takes away from the Word of God, and he preaches that message, then my friend, that message will not be a message that will bring salvation but it would be a message that would bring condemnation. So there are no latter-day revelations. When you look at Galatians 1, drop down at verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That's verse 7. I said verse 6 earlier. And then he says, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He was to be anathemated. He repeats the same thing in the ninth verse. As we have said before, so say I now again, emphasizing the point. If any preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be accursed. So my friend, we need to understand, there are no latter day revelations. We have the complete testament that God is given through the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write the Word of God. This book is inspired of God. It is literally God-breathed. Most of you know 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 by heart. If not, then if I start the verse, then you can probably complete the verse. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Observe carefully all Scripture. That includes the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Now, we live under the new economy or New Testament, New Covenant of Jesus Christ. The old law was done away with on the cross, Colossians 2 and verse 14. And so we live under a far superior, better covenant than the old. As a matter of fact, the book of Hebrews has a key word in it, doesn't it? 
It appears some 13 times, and that word is better. Everything's better about Christianity. And so we find, friend, that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, all-authoritative Word of God. We're not dealing with a document that some think tank sat around and they thought of and said, this is it. Oh, no, no. This is God's Word. The only way God is speaking to us is through His Word. Now, there are individuals that often would tell their people that uh, God has given them a message. Now, listen. If someone tells you that they have found something that no one has ever found before, you need to reject it right there. Because there's nothing new at all. All that we need, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, is in the Bible. He has given us all things that pertain to their life and godliness. So all of the Word of God is inspired of our Heavenly Father. So we need to treat the Word of God with great respect. As we approach the Word of God, we should have a heart that has a desire to really want to know the truth. And we're going to have a lesson pertaining to that very subject, things we need to know about truth next Lord's Day. But now, I want you to notice another thing about the Bible. There are no Latter-day Revelations. It is a once and for all delivered message. We're to earnestly contend for that. As a matter of fact, that verse we well know, verse 3, you will notice the latter part of that, that we're to contend for the faith. The faith there is not your or my individual faith. We're to contend for that. We understand that. But the faith is the system of Christianity. We're to earnestly contend for the system of Christianity. And so, my friend, when we look at the Bible, it is also authoritative. Authoritative. Whatever we do in word or deed, we do by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is by His authority. Colossians 3 and verse 17. Authority is very important. We understand authority. I know several policemen. I've had policemen in my family. I have a relative now that is a policeman. Someone told me, I haven't seen your son in a long time. I often tell them, well, you go through town where he is a policeman about 95 miles an hour when he's on duty and you get to meet him. Well, they don't want to meet him that bad. But the point is this. If he were to pull someone over and uh, they, he were to say, I pulled you over because you're speeding, and they were to say, by what authority are you pulling me over? Well, he would let them know that it wasn't by his authority, but he has the authority invested in him as an officer of the law. So we, we understand authority. The authority, whether we do or not do something, is in the Word of God. And let me say something very kindly, but very forthrightly. When individuals have come to the conclusion that they can lay aside, set aside biblical authority, then friends, any and everything is going to go. We are a people that are regulated by the New Testament. If there is no Bible authority for something, then we are not going to do it. It is unfortunate that there are churches of Christ throughout the land who all of a sudden have decided that, they say after much prayer and study, they've come to the conclusion that instrumental music is not a fellowship issue. Now, my friend, if it is not a fellowship issue, then we just might as well use the instrument. But it is still true, and it cannot be proved otherwise, that the reason we do not use instrumental music in faithful churches of Christ is because there is no Bible authority for it. And the kind, that's a key word, the kind of music, as in Ephesians 5.19, that is authorized of the Lord is the vocal music. So we are a people that go by the scriptures. We understand the Bible is authoritative. And so when we turn to the scriptures, we look at it with great respect. We do not worship the Word of God. The Word of God instructs us how to worship God. You know, God is the Spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. So the Word of God supplies us, as we mentioned earlier, with whatever we need. Now, why is it 
that uh, the good brethren here at uh, the Nettleton Church of Christ, when they observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday, why don't they have uh, cornbread and buttermilk on the Lord's table? Someone says, well, well, that's ridiculous. Well, why? Why don't they have that though? Someone says, well, because it's not in the Bible. That's right. In other words, there's no authority for it. So we do by what is stated in Scripture. We go to 1 Corinthians 11, start at verse 23. We observe the Lord's Supper as instructed by our Lord, which goes back to Matthew 26 when he instituted the Lord's Supper. So we know that when we partake of the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, we have authorization from the Scriptures. The early disciples met on the first day of the week and they break bread. We know that. Look at Acts 20 and verse 7 as a Bible example. I, I find it very interesting that individuals, groups, religious groups, who partake of the Lord's Supper quarterly or once a year, they don't think it's necessary. But isn't it interesting <laughs> they think it's necessary to take up a collection every first day of the week? And if you look at 1 Corinthians 16, look at the first two verses, and if you were to ask, why do you take up a collection each Lord's Day? Well, they say, well, it's commanded on the first day of the week. Then we would, in like turn, turn to Acts 20 and verse 7 and 1 Corinthians 11 and show that they partook of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. So, my friend, there is Bible authority for what we're doing here. There's Bible authority for what is involved in worship in churches of Christ that are faithful. There's Bible authority as far as what's involved in the work and worship of the church. There's Bible authority for what is involved in what we can do to build up and edify the body of Christ. And so the Word of God comes from our Heavenly Father. He has given it to us that we might know Him. You just pause and think. The very first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, simply states, in the beginning, God. That's the first part of that verse. Now, He does not have to explain Himself at all. He lets us know who He is. He gives us enough information about Him that is all that we need. A lot of times folks have thousands of questions they think are not answered in Scripture, and many of them are not. But we need to understand, if we cannot find a specific answer to some question, then it doesn't pertain to salvation. I can tell you that. Because anything that pertains to how to become a Christian and how to live a faithful Christian life is found within the pages of the inspired, inerrant Word of God. David, in the long ago, said in Psalm 119 and verse 105, he said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now you just pause and think about that right there. And so when we turn to the word of God, we read God's message to us. And God speaks to us through the word. The word of God can convict us. The word of God is a powerful message. Very, very powerful. You can sit in the still of the night, open up your Bible, and as you read the Word of God, you find great comfort. All of us, my age and others, have lost loved ones. Many of them were not members of the body of Christ. Our hearts break because of that. Many were unfaithful members of the body of Christ. Again, we're very sad. We're thankful for those, as far as we know, who faithfully followed our Lord and died, live according to the Scriptures. We find strength and comfort from the Word of God that no mortal man can give us. The Word of God is of such a nature that it explores man in a way that no other book can. Let me give you an example. When you turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, I want you to note that 12th verse. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now notice it piercing even divine, uh, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. J. D. McGarvey was a great gospel preacher in the 1800s. No, I was not around in the 1800s. But he was a great scholar 
And Brother McGarvey, when he looked at this verse, he concluded that it, when you really delve into the verse, it is laying bare everything in such a way to let us know that the Word of God is such a powerful instrument that if it were possible, as one writer said or man said, to divide the soul from the spirit, the Word of God is that powerful. It is a powerful message, and it, it penetrates us. It convicts us of our sins. Look at Acts 20, verse 32. When Paul addressed the message to those Ephesian elders, he warned them that there'd be things coming from within the eldership. He warned them of false teachers that were to come in. And the 32nd verse, he says, And now I commend you to God, and what else? To the word of his grace. What's it able to do? Which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. When we put on the whole armor of God that Paul discusses in Ephesians chapter 6, and he starts at verse 10, we put that on because we are in the fight for our eternal soul salvation. He lets us know that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities and powers in heavenly places. The devil is a very powerful, real being, but he's not more powerful than God. He's like the lion, that's true. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, trying to destroy us. But notice the ninth verse. Whom resists steadfast in the faith? He can be resisted. When our Lord was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, on every occasion he answered, it is written. The Word of God is powerful. It is extremely powerful. And when we put on this whole armor, and like in Ephesians 6 and verse 17, we're taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so, friends, we use the Word of God. It's powerful. How powerful is the Word of God? Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I always get this kind of bum puzzled in my mind, so I just turn and read the verses. Chapter 10, 2 Corinthians, verse 4, verse 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's power. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Roman Empire was a powerful empire. What brought down the Roman Empire? I'm going to tell you what brought it down. I really believe, as preachers of years ago stated, it was through the preaching and the teaching and godly living of faithful saints that pulled down that evil empire. Those early Christians were placed in the arena. They were given the choice, denounce Christ and live, accept him and die. And untold numbers of them would not forfeit their belief and faith in Jesus Christ. They died physically, but they lived forever spiritually. Those enemies could not understand why people would die for a dead man. They could not understand that. And the more they fought against Christians, the stronger Christians became. And so, my friend... The Word of God is that which we need to study daily. You know 2 Timothy 2.15, probably as well as anyone. We're instructed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the Word of truth. It's a shame that some people very seldom ever look at the Bible. They may have the only time spent with the Bible in a Bible class, or doing a sermon, but as far as opening up the book and thoroughly digesting the content, they seldom if ever do that. Some have the idea, well, that's the job of the preacher to study for me that I might know. No, no, the preacher studies for himself that he might know. You need to study for yourself that you might know. And so when we look at the Word of God, my friend, it is the only instrument that God uses to bring men to him. 
Think for a moment. The Lord gave the apostles the great commission. Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to who? Every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. And so they went everywhere preaching the word. When you turn to the book of Acts, it energizes the church. I can guarantee you that. If you feel down and low, and if you want to read of a group of people that didn't have modern things that we have today, but they literally went everywhere preaching and teaching the gospel. You turn to the book of Acts. That doesn't give us details about everything, and everything the apostles did is not recorded in the Bible. But it is, as the late brother Dixon, H.A. Dixon, president of Freed Harbin, used to say, it is some of the acts of some of the apostles. And the Lord has given us the information we need to know about those early disciples. And they preached the gospel so effectively that Paul said that every creature under heaven had heard the gospel. Colossians 1.23. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely amazing. Brother Emmett Smith was a wonderful gospel preacher, president of Crowley's Ridge. I had the privilege of going there. Many of you folk in the audience were there when I went there. Brother Smith would often say the gospel is a great commission is often repeated but has not been repeated in our lifetime. You think about that. And so it is, my friends, the Bible. We need to reverence God, reverence His Word, study the Bible, lay it in our heart, live according to the teaching of the Word of God. And the Lord said, Blessed are they that do His commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and they may enter in through the gates into the city. We appreciate so much you tuning into this program today. We hope you'll be with us next Lord's Day as we talk about some things you need to know about truth. Until then, we bid you a very fine good day. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Jesus saves, Jesus saves.